Welcome in the name of Jesus for this time of worship. We're so glad that you're here. If you're a guest, we'd especially love to connect with you, and a great place to do that is at walkiechurch.life. In fact, this is a great place for all of us to take our next steps. Today is the first Sunday in Lent, the season of 40 days as we prepare for the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We begin a new worship series, Soundings, as we consider the depth of our faith. Now, making a sounding is the ancient practice of determining the depth of the sea by feeding out a line, usually a rope marked at intervals or of fathoms with a weight at the end. Each week in Lent, our scripture will help us to throw out another sounding line to measure your faith. Please consider sharing this video. It's a great way to share Jesus with others. Welcome. Today is the first Sunday in Lent. We begin a new worship series, Soundings, How Deep Is Your Faith? Making a sounding is that ancient practice of determining the depth of uh, the sea or another body of water uh, by feeding out a line. You throw in this line, uh, usually it's a rope and it has something tied in it every six feet, you know, every fathom. And then it has a weight on the end, drops down in front until it, it hits the, uh, the bottom. And, um, and, and then they know 
how deep that water is there. And it's important to do this. I mean, if the water is too shallow, then sailors know that they're in danger of, of running aground or even sinking. The Apostle Paul in the New Testament wrote to Timothy and said, by rejecting conscience, certain persons have suffered shipwreck in their faith. So each week now during Lent, we'll be throwing out sort of another sounding line um, to, to measure the depth of our faith. In our scripture text that we're reading now, it's the last stop in the wilderness. The Israelites, they're poised on the brink of the promised land. This is the climax of the Exodus story. So after 39 years and 11 months and one week in the wilderness, the Israelites are gathered on the plains of Moab and they're poised to enter the promised land. Our text that we're reading is part of a much longer speech from Moses just before his death. And in it, the Israelites are commanded to give thanks to God and to remember God's salvation and God's blessings. Hear these words. When you have come into the land that the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance to possess, and you possess it and settle in it, you shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground which you harvest from the land that the Lord your God has given you. You shall put it in a basket and go to the place that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. You shall go to the priest who is in office at that time and say to him, Today I declare to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our ancestors to give us. When the priest takes the basket from your hand and sets it down before the altar of the Lord your God, you shall make this response before the Lord your God. A wandering Aramean was my ancestor. He went down into Egypt and lived there as an alien, few in number, and there he became a great nation, mighty and populous. When the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us by imposing hard labor on us, we cried to the Lord, the God of our ancestors. The Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with a terrifying display of power and with signs and wonders. And he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground that you, O Lord, have given me. You shall set it down before the Lord your God and bow down before the Lord your God. Then you, together with the Levites and the aliens who reside among you, shall celebrate with all the bounty that the Lord your God has given to you and to your house. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Whenever my family gets together, we're having a celebration, it's a holiday or a birthday or something. Whenever we get together, we gather around the dinner table and we always end up telling stories. We, we tell the stories uh, of our family and we laugh and we seem to tell the same stories over and over. I mean, it's how we remember who we are. Maybe your family is like that as well, or maybe you have a group of friends you do that with. I mean, some of the most interesting stories, I think, are how we came to be where we are. Where did your, your relatives, your ancestors come from? How did they get you here to where you are now? Why is your family the way it is? I know that's kind of a loaded question, right? Why is your family the way it is? Why do you live where you live? Why are you who you are? In telling our stories over and over, we remember, we rehearse them, you know? We remember. We remember who we are, and remembering is so powerful. It can be transformative. It can change us, and form us, and shape us. German theologian Gerhard Lofink, in his wonderful book, Does God Need the Church?, he says, the church's most intensive moment is remembering. This is the, the first sounding line that we're throwing out in front of the boat, so to speak, to, to measure the depth of our faith. How deeply do you remember? Now, up until this moment in our scripture, the Israelites, the people of Israel, they had been wanderers. They didn't have a land of their own. And we can identify with that, I think. I mean, we, we have land, uh, but we're not there yet, right? The Israelites, they were a people who wandered and they lived in tents 
it's significant then that this wonderful passage, this confession of faith, that they're supposed to rehearse as they remember, says, a wandering Aramean was my ancestor. That wandering Aramean was Jacob, and through him, Abraham. The Lord is God of Abraham and Isaac and, and Jacob. And this had been a long journey, painfully underscored by, by now 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. But now the Israelites, they have arrived at this moment, and they are about to, to be settled in their own land. So it's been... 39 years and 11 months and one week out in the wilderness where they've been wandering. And Moses said to the people, here we are, we're about to go into the promised land, but, but when you have come into the land that the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance in order to possess, and when you possess it and when you settle in it, then remember, remember, remember to tell this story because this story tells you who you are. Remember the promise the Lord God made to our ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob. And remember the exodus out of Egypt. And remember that it is the Lord God who is giving us this land. Remember, remember all this is a gift from the Lord our God. It is grace. It is God's grace. And so the focus here, the focus is on the actions of God in history, and especially the actions that brought the people into this particular territory in order to give it to them. And I do think this is a wonderful scripture for us, the Waukee United Methodist Church, as we are poised on the brink of a new land. I mean, it's been 15 years since this congregation sort of stepped out in faith and purchased the land on L.A. Grant Parkway. And, and this last 15 years hasn't been an easy journey in that regard. There's been much to overcome, but here we are now. We're poised on the brink of this new land. We're going to break ground this spring on that land that the Lord our God has given us. And we remember... We remember our difficulty and our wandering, and we remember that the Lord our God has brought us to this land with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. And Moses calls out to us from the plains of Moab and says, God's people, walk ye United Methodist Church, remember, remember what God has done. Remember what God has done to make you who you are and give thanks. We are a people, as God's people, who always have to remember who we are. And that's how the synagogue oriented, or that's how the synagogue originated for the Israelites in the first place. And this was about 600 years before the time of Jesus. And the Babylonians, they came and they, they conquered the Israelites and they carried them off into exile. It was a terrible time. The Jerusalem temple lay in ruins. The, this nationalized sort of worship center uh, there came to an abrupt halt. The Jews were in captivity in Babylon, and they wondered how could they survive? How could they keep their identity? How could they remember who they are? As it says uh, in the Psalms, how could they sing the, the Lord's song in a foreign land? This is how. Israel kept its identity by remembering. By remembering. They remembered what God had done. They remembered God's actions. And so they gathered together uh, as synagogues and they read scripture. And they prayed together. They read the Old Testament, the, the Torah, the prophets, the writings. And they remembered what God had done. They remembered who they were. And that, of course, is the foundation for our own Christian worship as well. We gather uh, like the ancient Christians did in following the ways of the Israelites, the, the Jewish people. We gather as Christians to read Scripture and remember what God has done. We read Scripture because it's our story. It's God's story, and we're a part of that, and it, and it tells us who we are. We live in a, a strange place, a, a foreign land, so to speak. And sometimes it feels maybe like we're in exile, or maybe sometimes it feels like we're this mission outpost in the midst of a, a foreign, in the midst of a foreign land. But we are called to remember who we are, and so the scriptures contain all our family stories. They tell us over and over again who we are, and we remember. And then after we read those scriptures, those stories, we gather at the table. 
for one of the greatest moments of remembering when we receive Holy Communion. We, we remember how Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples and also how he took the cup and, and how he blessed it and gave it and how Jesus said, you know, take and eat, do this in remembrance of me. And that Greek word for remember is anamnesis. Anamnesis. It, it's the ancient Greek word that literally means loss of forgetfulness. Anamnesis means that, that, that we make present, again, something from the past. It's not just mentally recalling something. It's more intense than that. It's literally standing in the presence of what God has already done and experiencing it anew. Experience again the saving power, anamnesis, remember, make it present again. And it's so important for us to remember so that we don't get lost on our journey, so that we don't wake up one day and discover that we've gotten off track, that we're not where we want to be, where God wants us to be, that we're not the people that we're meant to be. Jesus shows us I think a good example of that in, in the gospel reading appointed for today. After Jesus' baptism and the confirmation of his identity as the Son of God, then uh, in the gospel reading today, we hear that the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness where he fasted and prayed for 40 days. And then the devil came and challenged Jesus. He uh, provoked Jesus into proving that he is who he really is, that he really is the Son of God. But the devil tried to get Jesus to, to prove his identity through demonstrations of power and privilege. He tried to lead Jesus sort of to a different place, along a different path by distorting what it means for Jesus to really be the Son of God. And so the devil said, hey, if you really are the Son of God, and turn these stones into sandwiches. you got to be famished, right? You haven't eaten anything for, for 40 days. You're starving. And Jesus said, no. And then Jesus quoted Scripture in Deuteronomy, and he said, humans don't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. See, Jesus knows that there are voices in this world that if we listen to them, will help us lose our way. And the most important thing is to be fed by the God that we know through Jesus. And then the devil, he led Jesus to a high vantage point. He showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And I don't know that he could do this, but the devil promised Jesus he could have it all. He can have everything, all the glory of the world, all the splendor that we see in the world, if he would just fall down and worship the devil. And again, Jesus said, no. And again, quoting Deuteronomy, Jesus said, we worship the Lord God only. We serve God only. See, Jesus knows that there are voices in the world that if we listen to them, will help us to lose our way. And there are a lot of people who trade their souls for some kind of power to get to the top or even to just get to the next stop. And then the devil took Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple in Jerusalem and again said, if you really are God's son, then throw yourself down because God will take care of you. And, and, and the devil was quoting scripture here. But again, Jesus said, no. He said, the Lord is not to be tested. Again, this is from Deuteronomy. Jesus knows that there are voices in the world that if we listen to them, they will lead us astray. They will help us lose our way. Jesus didn't seize the temple by force with some sort of heroic glory, controlling the narrative, controlling the outcome of his destiny. And, and we aren't to do that either in the church. It's, it's important that Jesus remembers who he is so he doesn't get lost, so he doesn't get off track, so he doesn't start going the wrong direction. And likewise, it's important for us that we remember who we are, and, and of course, who Jesus is and what it means to follow Jesus so we don't get lost, so that we don't get off track and start serving the world's norms and values and kingdoms. Because you see, after the, the devil had finished challenging Jesus, it says that he departed until an opportune time. That is, the devil would come back. There's the 
a persistent temptation to lose the way if we don't remember. And if we're going to be like Jesus, it's important to remember who we are, to lay down our agendas, to set our wills aside, to submit to the God that we know through Jesus so that we stay on that path, so that we stay clearly in God's kingdom, so that we don't get lost on the journey because we're following something else or thinking something else or, or having some sort of strategy or agenda that's ours instead of, instead of the Lord God's. Being a people who remember, that's the first sounding line that we, we throw out there in front of the boat. And, and in Scripture, uh, a boat is a, uh, a wonderful metaphor for the church. So we throw that sounding line out in front of the boat to measure the depth of our faith. And we ask that question, how deep is your faith as you remember? How, how deeply do you remember? So after 39 years, 11 months, and one week of wandering, the Israelites, they're poised on the brink of the promised land, and they're called to remember who they are. They're called to remember the actions of God in history, and especially the actions that tell them their story, that tell them who they are and where they came from and, and who their family is and what they're supposed to be about, what they're supposed to be doing, blessing the world as they've been blessed by, by the Lord God and, and how God has given them this promised land, this particular wonderful place, a land filled with milk and, and honey. But now think about our story. For us, we remember all that God has done, where we came from, and who we are and what we're about and what God has done in our midst, right? So we remember all that God has done in the last 43 years in our previous location. And then, and then really 150 years, right? Uh, uh, over 150 years now as a congregation. But here it's been, it's been 22 weeks of wandering for us now. Five months and, and one week since we started gathering in interim locations we probably have another 10 months or so before we take possession of our new location, this new ministry center, our promised land, we might say at this point. And so we are poised on the brink of an inheritance as God's people. And soon we will possess that place. We will settle in it. And I think in this moment, Moses calls out to us from the plains of Moab, he says, walk ye United Methodist Church, remember, anamnesis, remember, we are standing in the presence of what God has already done and experiencing anew its saving power for us. Remember, remember the actions that brought us into this particular territory, this particular place and how God is giving it to us. We stand on the brink and when we arrive, remember and give thanks to God. Lent is an important time to remember, to remember who you are, to remember what God has done, to remember that Jesus lived with us and suffered for us and died for us and that God raised Jesus from the dead for us. It's, it's important to remember that, that the Holy Spirit has been poured out upon us, that the church belongs to Jesus and operates by God's will. It's important to remember that the decisions we make and the, and the hopes that we have, they don't necessarily correspond to what the world thinks is best, but rather with what God thinks and with what God is doing. This is the sounding line that we're throwing out. Remember, we plunge it out in front of the boat. And again, it's, it's been used, you know, the boat has been used as a metaphor for the church in Scripture. We, we throw that sounding line out to see how deep it is right there, right? We drop that line to see how deeply it goes. How deeply do we remember? Anamnesis. Remember who you are. Remember who we are. Make it present again, what God has done and is doing and will do. And may our remembering shape and form us as God's people. Thanks be to God. 
I invite you in this time of prayer with me. Please set aside that cup of coffee or tea, your tablet or phone. Just find some way that you can focus on something natural. Close your eyes, whatever. Take an attitude of prayer with me as we do the special thing we're called to as Christians. Lift our prayers to the Lord. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray for all who live in places of threat and danger. We trust in you, for you are able to make peace in the midst of warfare and turn rough places into smooth ground. Teach us to prepare a table where enemies may feast instead of fight. We pray for peace, and especially an end to war and violence between Russia and Ukraine. As Methodists, we do not condone acts of war and violence as solutions to issues, no matter how old or deep. And here, we cannot understand the horrors of armed conflict that we only see images of. So let us do what we can and pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ in those countries to offer aid and support through the channels we have and continue to pray for those in the part of the world, in the nations of the world, seeking to come together in unity to de-escalate what's happening there. We pray for those who do not have enough, enough to eat, enough to wear, or do not get enough justice. We trust in you, for you fill what is empty with good things and lift up the lowly. Help us to share the abundance we enjoy and to work for the freedom and dignity of all your children. We pray for all who are chronically homeless, wandering our streets and sleeping unprotected, and for those who are homeless for a season because of natural disaster or economic trouble. We trust in you, for you give even to the sparrow a nest where she may lay her young. Make us more determined to assist those who need a place to live. We pray for healing for the pandemic in our country and around the world. And even now, as mask mandates are being relaxed, help us to remember to respect each other and to honor each other in the choices they make. We pray for the church, dividing and uniting, wavering and witnessing. We trust in you. We remember that you called the church into being and have made us your body in and for the world. Keep your church from being both uncertain and too certain. Help us to joyfully trust that the Spirit is leading us into new opportunities of faith and service. We pray for our congregation here at Waukee. May we faithfully follow Jesus on your adventure. We pray for our building project this year and for our outreach to, to new people and, and inviting them in to experience the joy and life in God's kingdom. Help us to continue to think about new people we can invite and how we can extend that warm hand of offering. We pray for those who suffer in body, mind, or heart. We trust in you, for you are able to heal and to make whole in this life and the next. Make us tender caregivers, that your healing power may be at work in us and through us. And closer to home, we pray for healing for Keith and for peace and comfort for Cindy, Michaela, and their family as they deal with the loss of their father and grandfather. We pray now for all those we lift up to the Lord silently in our hearts and minds. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious and generous God, we are amazed by the good gifts you bestow in abundance. Thank you for food that sustains us on our journey. Thank you for the company of saints to whom we are joined. Thank you for the prospect of hope and peace in the world. Thank you for giving us your work to do on earth. We remember, Lord. We remember as we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. Hello, thank you for connecting with us. Here are some next steps for our faith journey together. Thank you for your support of our biannual food drive in February. You gave 739 pounds of food to help feed hungry people in Dallas County. We'll have another food drive in September, so keep an eye out for that. But in the meantime, in March, we will be providing another Trinity meal and you'll receive information about our special Lenten offering uh, to help send students to camp this summer. And next week, we will have uh, Iowa Camping Director Brian Johnson with us to talk about that. 
We have now entered the season of Lent, the 40-day season of penitence, fasting, and prayer, as we prepare for Jesus' suffering, death, and resurrection. In addition to our worship series, Soundings, How Deep Is Your Faith?, we also have some Lenten devotionals available at the Welcome Center. How will you be engaging in prayer, fasting, giving, and reading, and meditating and script on scripture during Lent? And let us know if you'd like some help connecting with a small group for Lent. Brian Crone, Crone is starting the men's group again. If you're interested, you can text Brian at 515-210-4706. Uh, it will be a mix of study and events, and men are welcome to join whatever parts they feel they would enjoy. Finally, you're welcome to give an offering today, in person, or at waukeechurch.life to support the mission and ministry of this church. Thank you for your generosity. I'm Michaela Kickmile, I'm the administrative assistant here, and you can contact me in the office at any time. Thanks for joining with us. Receive this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. 